name is Maura Ryan and this is Education First. As you know, the school board and administration held their meeting for their reopening plan on July 21st. Many concerned parents emailed the school board and um, came to the meeting with their masks and their hand sanitizer and got up and spoke. It was difficult to hear, but after the meeting, a lot of parents had a lot of questions as to what might happen. As you know, the board is planning on voting on the reopening plan on August 4th. There has been an additional meeting added on August 14th to, in case more discussion is needed. Um, as of right now, parents are wondering what their options are, and we wanted to talk today about what options are available to parents uh, so that they know what is available in the event that they want to change their educational plans for the fall. During the meeting, uh, many parents did ask questions. Those questions were not all answered. Um, an FAQ page did go up, which is on the board site um, and the school district site, but it only has 10 responses. So there are way more questions than answers at this point, um, and hopefully the board will answer the additional questions. I know I myself got up and asked seven questions and got two answers. Um, the most popular questions obviously had to do with what school would be looking like, um, and parents want to know what to do to move forward. So what are the options? Um, one of the, th the options that we wanted to talk about um, is homeschooling. I have with me here Patrice Bernard. She's also an educational advocate, and she's a homeschooler. She has four kids, uh, one of whom went to a charter school, three of whom have homeschooled, and all of whom have attended public school at some point in time. Um, Patrice, can you tell us about homeschooling? Well, homeschooling is, is as varied as you want it to be. It doesn't, my homeschool won't look like your homeschool and it won't look like my best friend's homeschool across the country. So homeschooling is different from remote learning in that you pick your own curriculum. I have a child, my youngest, the only one that's remaining in school right now is going into the seventh grade. However, I have found that his grammar level is at a second grade level and his reading level is about a ninth grade level, and his math level is about fifth grade. So when I want to develop a homeschool program for him, most likely I can, I'm going to piecemeal it this year. In the past when I've homeschooled before, I used a very rigorous Catholic curriculum from seatonhome.org. Um, it, it's a curriculum in a box. Lots of places do this now. You say, I want grade six or grade seven. In comes your box from UPS, drops it off. In there are all your textbooks, all your consumable workbooks, and your lesson plan. But again, that's just one of the many, uh, one of the many homeschool programs. There are Catholic homeschooling. There is Christian homeschooling. There is secular homeschooling. There is classical homeschooling. And then you can just mix and match and do whatever you want. For this coming year, I think we had already prepared to do VLAX for science because my son did like the remote learning in that there was no chaos in the classroom. Well, now, not everybody knows what VLAX is, so what if we explain that? Okay, VLAX is the Virtual Learning Academy Charter School. Mm -hmm. it is a, I believe it was the first public charter school in, Man in New Hampshire. It is open to any New Hampshire resident for free. No tuition, doesn't cost you a dime. It is a public charter school that offers its curriculum online. My oldest daughter, well, my only daughter, took VLAX because she had medical issues in high school, so she had to supplement with VLAX. Come to find out her teacher was the daughter of her librarian from when she was in elementary school. Oh, what a coincidence. So, uh, these are local people who are instructing your students. And she took her for an economics class. Well, my dear Sarah struggled a little bit, didn't really understand this, but she would meet, we meet weekly with her VLAX teacher, Mrs. Sparks. And that is a benefit, because you get a one-on-one -on -one with one -on -one, the teacher. One-on-one, and, and then Mrs. Sparks also had open office hours some evening, some afternoon, a couple morning, so that all the students could meet with them when it was possible, when it was convenient for both the teacher and the family. Uh, I was able to ask any questions I had. 
And so they would talk through the, Sarah would read the chapter, she'd talk it through with her, and her teacher, and then she'd go do the homework. She had a digital photography class to fulfill her ICT requirement. Same thing, if she had any questions, she'd just chat with her teacher. So there was the one-on-one -on -one contact, but she could do it at 1 a.m. She could do it at 8 a.m. She could do it at 2 p.m. It didn't matter. What VLAX does provide is a pacing chart. So you, if you tell them what day you're starting and you tell them what day you want to finish, they will give you a pacing chart of where you need to be at the end of each week. Right. So it's not leaving the child up completely on their own. However, I would not recommend it for everyone. There is no one size fits all when it comes to education. Of course, you know my son is terrible at right. anything remote. He doesn't have the organizational right. skills. Right. It to needs carry someone it who's motivated, right. someone who can work independently. Now, VLEX has expanded this year. Before, they were like grades Five. six through 12. Right, right, right. Then I saw that in the spring they were going to go to grades four. Now I see, starting today, They've opened up enrollment for kindergarten. I don't know how you teach a child to read remote, on, remotely or online. I think you need to be beside the child. But well, I it, it could also be that they've broken out these one-on-one -on -one meetings. Maybe they meet. I know the high school and middle schoolers meet once a week for an hour individually with the teacher. Perhaps they do more. I have no idea. That's something I haven't investigated. But VLAX it's V-L-A-C-S dot org. They've got lots of information on the website. They have virtual tours, so you can see what it's all about. I would recommend them as one of your options. Right, right. If you, and it's not homeschooling, but it's something that I'm going to use as part of my homeschooling curriculum. And their courses are accredited. They're recognized by virtually every district in the state. And so they you are can accepted transfer for credit. And they, and they also have the Running Start classes and the advanced, the college level where you get college credits. And that is an advantage, obviously, because who wants to pay for extra classes right. when your kid's going to college? Right. So if you are got a high school junior or senior, take advantage of those. And there are some scholarships available, too, if you do Running Start. If you want to do it in conjunction with a college and you are low income, you can apply for a 50% discount. discount. Right. And the governor, actually, in one of his executive orders, just put uh, $1.5 million towards anyone who wants money towards a homeschooling uh, curriculum, that they can apply for that and they can get that homeschooling money to cover those funds. I'd rather the governor just say, well, you can have your tax dollars back, but that's me, you know, <laughs> because then I, I could, <laughs> then I could get more. Well, but, home, but homeschooling, the nice thing about homeschooling is you set it up, you work with your child. What works for your child? Is your child an early morning person, an early riser? Fine, get up, they can start at seven. My children are night owls, so they don't like to start before nine or 10. We do what works for us. We do it, we don't, we try the doing it like school where we have math every day, spelling every day, um, reading every day. Didn't work so well for my children. My children used to sit down and take their spelling workbook they say, I'm going to work on spelling for a while. Okay. And they, I, they'd say, give me the pretest. And if they got an 80 or better, we moved on to the next chapter, to the next lesson. So now you also did some classical curriculum with your students well, as well. Well, with the Seton Home, it's a classical Catholic education. So when they had an, their English, it wasn't just English. There was a grammar and composition book. There was a reading book. There was a comprehension skills workbook. There was a critical thinking skills workbook. And there were four book reports every year. Every quarter was a book report. Two of the books had to be done on saints, but two of the books had to be classics. So my children have read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. They've read Johnny Tremaine. They've read The Yearling. They've read, um, you know, just about any, they've read Shakespeare, of course. So, and then, the nice thing about if you enroll in a homeschool curriculum, in a homeschool program, when I enrolled, it was like enrolling my child in school. I did not give the grades. My children took tests and all those book reports, they were scanned and emailed to Virginia, 
where there are accredited teachers who actually do the grading. So I didn't give my child an A on their book report. The teacher did. So it, it kind of, a lot of people say, well, homeschooling, you know, kids are, parents are lazy. Not really. If you love your child, you're not lazy. You actually want what's best for your child. So I did that as a way of um, stopping the naysayers. Unfortunately, they are out there. But you can just homeschool. And here in New Hampshire, I believe you have to make a portfolio available at the end of the year. Correct. And there are also groups that can help with resources. I know Granite State Homeschoolers is a group, and they actually even did some co-op activities like they, uh, they had skiing on McIntyre. Right. Grants, G-S-H-E, I think, Grant State Home Educators. And I don't know if it's .com or .org. Couldn't well, tell they you. do have a Facebook page. They do. And I do know they had contact information at the library, which obviously the library's closed, but um, they can be contacted through their Facebook page right. as well. Right. And so I would reach out to them. Um, there are Catholic homeschooling groups. There are Christian homeschooling groups. There are Christian homeschool co-ops. And this is something... Parents are talking about, I'm sorry, I'm out of order, but that's okay. Um, Co-ops, homeschoolers have been doing it for years. Who wants to teach biology and chemistry? Not me. So you join a co-op, and you've got a parent who happens to enjoy biology and chemistry, or algebra or phys physics. I don't know who those parents are. They're not me. But you join a co-op, and a bunch of you parents get together, and one person teaches algebra, one person teaches biology, somebody teaches chemistry, someone teaches uh, whatever else. And like, say, if I were to join a co-op, I would teach English because that's my forte, that's my strength. So you get together once, twice, three times a week, depending on the co-op. All of your kids, you, whether you rent a church basement or um, a VFW hall or whatever, you get together. So you're all, you, you are homeschooling, but, but you're doing it together. Burn. Yeah. It's actually a popular option in Europe. My cousin in Europe is running a co-op right now, and she teaches music because she was a great dancer, and she could play the violin and the piano. She teaches music, and then they have another uh, gentleman who teaches language, and he's a native speaker, so oh. he has the perfect accent. And then they have another man who's an engineer, and he teaches the math and the science piece. So they have their whole co-op set, and they actually move from house to house. But that wow. way they also have socialization because it's a set mm -hmm. number of kids and they can control it and they're staying in the same environments. Right. Socialization, um, there are specific socialization skills for children with social skills deficits that need to be worked on. It doesn't necessarily need to be in a group of their peers. Correct. It could be multi-generational. Multi-generational, I have found with my other children, works better. So we did contra dancing. And that is from birth, from womb to the tomb, you will find contra dancers. Literally, um, people dancing in their 80s and 90s. And it's a multi-generational atmosphere, so because let's face it, the world is multi-generational. You never stay with a group. I mean, you're a young thing, I'm older. We don't stay with a group of our peers for the, our entire lives. It's better for children to learn how to socialize properly you don't want a bunch of 13-year-olds all making the same mistake. That just re is reinforcing bad habits. Better for them to be in a group that's multi-generational so that someone says, hey, knock it off. That's not what we do. Or, hey, you never, ever touch a girl. You know, that's well, not th done. That's the concept that Montessori is based off as well because they say if you have a multi-generational group, your younger peers will learn faster than if the group is... And same, our public modern. schools, our public schools used to know this. They had the one-room schoolhouse. It was from ages six to about fourteen or fifteen, and the older ones helped out with the younger ones. I have the 1930s standards from New Hampshire. It's got the instructions in there for what to do in a one-room schoolhouse. Your youngest children are supposed to go outside and play while you're teaching the older ones. Well, they do still have peer helpers, but the thing is, if we go into solely remote learning, how, how do you do a peer help situation because you're on a Zoom meeting, you're not necessarily connecting individually, and I, I found, just personally with my experience, my son didn't really have much contact with others outside of the Zoom meeting. I have many things to say about remote learning. 
Most because of them we, are not are just, not positive. Just to be clear, also when we talk about homeschooling, we are not talking about remote learning. Right. We're talking about doing your own curriculum at home at your own speed. Um, remote learning is entirely different because it is run by the school. And I do know last year our remote was set up. My son had to be logged in at 7:30. He couldn't log out until 3:10. And every class period there was something going on, and it was a long time in front of the computer. It's, I really it, it minimizes your social activity too because if you're watching a video, and everyone else is watching a video on their own link, they're really not interacting. So I that, could, that I was couldn't an sit issue. for that long. Well, I kind of liked this co-op idea because you do have a small pod of peers. Mm where you do know the other kids and you do travel from house to house so you minimize any type of contact with remote learning would be your own teachers teaching and sending things up correct are you satisfied with london dairy's teaching i mean are, are the london dairy parents satisfied in manchester 75 percent of our graduates are not competent or proficient in both english and math that's true but to be how, fair how are how are your students i mean to, to be fair, it was meant to be a short-term solution, and now it's becoming a longer-term solution. So how would we f refine that? Or if we don't want to refine that, what other options do we have? Homeschool being one, VLAX being another, co-ops being a third. Um, I'm, I'm, if you don't like what you're getting and if your scores aren't very good, look at your options because I wouldn't do remote learning. If, there, if it's not good enough, get out. Just get out. You, if you're going to be start, stuck home with your child all day, better it's a curriculum you pick than to be forced to help teach a curriculum that somebody else picked and who may not teach in the same style in which you do or in which your child learns. Well, obviously, as a parent, going back and trying to learn, I knew Google Classroom, but some of these other things I did not know. And trying to pick that up while trying to help him get through some of the concepts which have change since I was in school was a challenge. Right. Yeah, I, I love Google Classroom. It would be great if the teachers learned how to Manchester teach. Not everybody's great at it. Not when they post a document and all the kids start editing it. And they rename the document, fix this please. It was just, it was not funny. But um, one of the other options is obviously if you can afford to and you choose not to homeschool yourself, there are better options for those that can afford it, right? Meaning private schools. Private or parochial. Both of which generally turn out children with better proficiency scores. That's the plus. On the negative side, they don't take everybody. My child's not welcome at a private or parochial school. He has a personality disorder. He, his way is different and they just don't have the resources to deal with him. They don't have the background or knowledge of the psychology to deal with him. And quite frankly, they make their money. They don't need his money. So they're not gonna bother trying. So private and parochial are great for those that can afford it, great for those who are acceptable. But it's not public school. It's not public school, but in some cases they have a smaller environment and yes. in some cases with this executive <coughs> order where the governor is recognizing that some schools are not planning on opening, we, Londonderry is trying to put together a package to open. It's just going to depend on whether or not they can manage it and whether or not parents want to come. I obviously want my son to go back to school because he needs to be there to learn and engage. He needs that engagement. But the governor has set aside that $1.5 million so that um, it will go through the Children's Scholarship Fund Okay, Baker's organization. Correct. Okay. And going through the Children's Scholarship Fund, um, you can get that money to go to a private school if that's an option, if you need that full-time engagement. It is very difficult. You're right. My son wouldn't be able to go to a, pri a private school most likely because he does have an IEP and he does require special services. And um, it's unfortunate that one of the first lessons he learns in life is that not everybody's included everywhere, but this is right. something he will have to deal with going forward. Right. But it does work for some kids. If kids have had issues with bullying or if they just need a change of environment, maybe they need a different type of stimulation. Or if they need something stimulation. much more rigorous. You know, Most of them have more, much more rigorous curriculums. And this is open. So if, if for some reason your school is only offering remote or hybrid, which Manchester is, 
You, uh, that we officially haven't taken a vote yet. Well, yeah, but they put it in the paper. Pretty much <sighs> think it's going to be remote only. That's what the teachers want. But if you couldn't do that, if you have two parents who need to work, or if you mm -hmm. couldn't do hybrid because you have two parents who need to work, he is making that funding available so that you can go to a school. And some of these schools are offering scholarships so that yes. the cost will be covered so that no one would potentially yeah, be Yeah, I, I do know that um, the Catholic schools are offering a scholarship. I believe you have one here in London, Derry. Do or we? in Derry, Tom Sequinas. Oh, no, that's closed. Oh, really? Yeah. Recently, too. Manchester has Catholic schools. We have a lot of them. Um, and we have the middle school, we have the high school as well. I don't know if you're aware, there was a second organization that was giving scholarships calling the Giving and Going Alliance. No. Um, uh, but that is only through pre-approved um, partnership schools. And the, the disappointing thing was that the partnership schools are nowhere near Londonderry. The closest one was the Concord Christian Academy. Um, oh, it looks like they're all Christian. Yeah, they are. Okay. And so you have to go through and be pre-approved. And I don't, I don't know that anybody would want to drive to Concord, but it is an option if that is something right. that they do want to do. And that there is available, there is help available if you find that it's difficult because somebody's been laid off or you don't know if you can afford to pay for it. Right. Again, those Christian schools also do not have to accept everybody. So if you have a child with service who needs services, you can ask. The worst can, they can do is say no. You can get an ISP. An ISP is an individual services plan, but that is very dependent on what money the school has and whether or not they want to give you those services. Mm -hmm. um, Shalimar speaks about ISPs quite a bit because her son has one. He does attend a Catholic school, and he does get some services there, limited services. Um, but I, she is the only person I've known who has gotten the ISP. Wow. So... I kudos to her. I and you know we have talked about co-op schools, which are the schools where each group of parents right. takes right. And it's funny that you, you separate that out. So co-op is can be a thing in of itself, but it can also be with homeschooling. I mean, correct. It's it's. I this is the big. What if we've learned nothing else? Let's realize education is no longer a one size fits all, and I think the public schools in our cities and every town has to realize they're not the only game in town. This well, is the age of to choice now. The other thing, too, is with the state plan only approving 13% proficiency in reading, I'm sorry, 13% proficiency in math and 19% in reading for kids with IEPs, and they come right in at that mark, are we really giving these, fighting chance, these kids a fighting chance to get a job? No. And what can we do to improve that? I mean, so many parents have come to us complaining because they think their kid's going to get a high school diploma and all of a sudden they find out last minute, no, that's not the case. And then they're asking us to come in and help advocate. And at that point, there's not, there's not much we can do because we're no, talking no. We're in the, the, you know. The, the foundations, if it's not there in the foundational stages in high school, there's very little. But you don't be. know that if your, your progress report says everything's going great. Right. You do have to keep right. an eye on some of this testing. And, you know, Richard Wright's, um, Melissa Farrell's book, Tests and Assessments, is yes. obviously a huge deal and a very beneficial textbook in terms of understanding what your testing means. Right. Because somebody hands you a piece of paper, it's got a bunch of acronyms, charts, and what does it mean? I mean, we read these books because we need to understand the testing, right. but they are available to parents. Using an outside provider. Um, mm -hmm. So the only outside provider I know of that has maintained somewhat normalcy during this time period. They have moved to masks and hand sanitizer and cleanliness, but they've continued to offer therapies is um, Compass? Compass Behavioral. Compass Behavioral does a lot with ABA therapy, which is a treatment for kids with autism. Mm -hmm. um, they have decided to develop a program which has the ABA therapy, which is very time consuming because you are expected to do ABA therapy for 40 to 60 hours a week outside of school if you choose to wow. send your kid to school. But they've decided to do a wraparound program where you can actually attend school within the ABA therapy formula. This is Skinner, so this is known, it's a known therapeutic style. Um, and it's something that's said to improve outcomes with autistic Where children. Where are they offering that? So they're offering in a few locations. They've got mm -hmm. a location in Concord, I believe they just set one up in Manchester. They definitely have one in Nashua. They were also running social skills groups, which was another thing that they were trying to do to maintain some social and, skills. And that's a, so that's like paying for private school? Yes. Cost-wise, do you have any idea? As far as I know, private he was taking tuition? health insurance for it. They oh. were doing pre-approvals. Wow. 
So, and if you had Medicaid, that was something that they also took. Um, and that's something, there are other companies that offer those services. They're the only ones that I know of that have remained open during the pandemic. I mean, my son has an ABA therapist. They shut down completely and I'm, I'm waiting for things to start back up. So they're the only ones who, that I know of that remained open and that were offering this sort of combined service of we can do the education and academic and we can still do the Skinner. Because doing a six and a half hour school day and then doing 40 to 60 hours of services on top of that is pretty, yeah stressful and that's like having two full-time jobs as a kid right so that's not fair it's not something that i wanted to do just because i felt like it was a lot but there are other people who've done it very successfully and have had amazing outcomes with their children and, and so like we say it's no, no there is no one size fits all correct look at what's right for you your child and your family and we want our kids to be out in our workforce productive happy connecting with their peers so we want them to have the best chance possible. So we want to tailor that right. to them and not necessarily have it be that one size fits all cookie right. cutter. Now you've got your next option here. It's expensive. Hi she, she has that on her <laughs> list, hire a private tutor. Hiring a private tutor. Some families are doing this. Some families have decided it's well worth it to have someone come in. They're picking up kids who've just gotten out of college who are getting their teaching degree. Um, but this, this is not cheap. By any means. I believe people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, they were taught by private tutors, weren't they? Way back when? Oh, I don't know. I didn't know them personally. <laughs> I did. No. <laughs> Just kidding. But actually, if you look at... Um, it, it was done if we, if the we home, read, and it uh, was done with well, an educator. Little Women, referencing things back, Lori had a tutor. Yes. So there was a time when well-to-do families would hire a private tutor to come into their home. They'd offer them room and board, sometimes for free in exchange, plus a small stipend. It so it, back to the future, huh? Well, it, it can work. It can work because some people want to do it in conjunction with the remote learning curriculum, and some people want to do it as a separate, to do a separate homeschooling. Right, and, and there have are the teacher and do And there the are tutoring services that you can bring your child to a tutoring service. Absolutely. They have one over at the synagogue in Derry. That's a tutoring service. They also have tutoring for dyslexic children in Nashua that's offered for free. Um, they have the one, of, one of those, um, is it Kaplan or something? There's one in Manchester that's a, like a nationally known. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. They do have organizations. Yeah. Um, it's not just for special needs kids. This is. No. If your child wants to get a really good score in the SAT, they offer tutoring services. Princeton, et cetera. Yeah. You want right. to, you want to formulate because you want to direct your child towards a certain way you can do that so tutoring is for everybody uh, for any child it's not just for the special needs child or the bright child well one of the things I miss about the no child left behind was they did provide tutoring hours for disadvantaged children I I'm sorry that that went away but I do know that there's not always a viable option for low-income no. parents who can't stay home and can't no. manage remote <coughs> um, but there are places where <coughs> you can try and find um, what the governor's um, if you do the homeschooling route, you can put it towards tutoring services. Okay. So that, that is true. You can do that. And there are some kids that are medically unwell. and Medically they, fragile, yep. The parents can petition the school to have a, a tutor to come in the home. Obviously, yes. it's very difficult to achieve that, but it is an option to try. I um, know what's happened in Manchester. Medically yeah. fragile, immune-suppressed children have their classroom teacher or a teacher comes around twice a week, two or three times a week. Yes. to the home yep so that and that happens nationwide because my own nephew out in nevada had one right um so we've had some parents in Goffstown, some other towns get that so yeah but not during covid huh? well that would be a complication too right there are some people who are still willing to do it and there are some companies that are still willing to do it like compass but can you get anybody to go out right right um and if you're just doing it remote what's the difference really it's it's no difference Right. No. Remote Remote is remote. It's not in-person services. Correct. So our, our next option, charter something schools. we both have experience with, charter schools. Charter schools. <laughs> charter yeah. schools, charter are schools, schools are public schools. Charter schools are public schools. They are public schools that have to meet certain requirements. They are a little bit different than regular public schools just because their teething, teaching methodology can be different and they don't have to have a certain number of certified teachers. And they're usually supposed to have a specific focus. They're supposed to be geared towards a child that is looking for a specific type of education. Grant State Arts Academy. 
They're looking for kids who are the artsy fartsy types. Well, artistic. <laughs> I'm older, artsy fartsy works for me. So those children would go someplace like that. We have schools up in up north in Tilton. I believe there's a classical learning academy. Classical education, guess what? They teach Latin in an elementary school and it works. And there are charter schools for younger ages too, like Mill Falls Charter School, which is a Montessori. Montessori. Based. Right. Don't think about Mills Falls. It has like a six hundred student waiting list. If you want if you have a two year old, you might want to go get your child on the um, waiting list now. Well, you bring up a point because charter schools are required to take everybody regardless of whether you have an IEP or not. School services are provided by your sending district. Correct. Most of the kids do come from the town where the charter school resides. So one, of, located, the, yep. one of the issues of the charter schools, they are somewhat reliant on that town to provide their busing. And if that town chooses to do remote or hybrid and doesn't have busing for the charter school, you may have to provide your own transportation. That is something to be aware of if that's an issue. But, I mean, my son went to Mills Falls and had a great experience. And, and if you check the test scores, Mills Falls ranks very high. They test it very well with the Montessori experience. Montessori is, is a one known style that is known to help kids with autism. Right. And since he has autism, that's why I really and, wanted to. And it that. helps all children. Right. I've, I've known many gifted children who have attended Montessori schools and have done exceedingly well. Um, Absolutely. But Mills Falls is an option. It is. And there uh, are other options. List. Yeah. The thing about charter schools, they have to take everyone if they have space available. Right. And so they do do a lottery every year. And normally that mm. lottery would have taken place in March. But a lot of schools didn't hold the lottery. So we have to wait and see what's going to happen. Right. They, and, and they have to figure out what they're doing in terms of are they doing a remote right. learn or an in-person. Because, you know, some parents want in-person. Right. Charter schools are an option. Now, um, you also have a list for kindergarten only. Kindergarten is not, right. Kindergarten so is not a required class. We have something called compulsory education laws. It starts at age six. You do not have to send, so it's not that kindergarten isn't a required class. It's that your child does not have to be in school until age six. I found this out with my first child who's now 30 years old. And the principal looked, came up to me, he sidled up to me, he said, God rest his soul, he's now deceased, been about a year. Um, he said, you know, Mrs. Bernard, they don't have to be here until they're six. And I said, really? He goes, when's his birthday? I said, July. He goes, yeah, you could have waited a year. I said, well, but we like the kindergarten teacher. He goes, I didn't say they had to be in first grade. They, he could start kindergarten at age six. Guess what I did? All the other kids, they started kindergarten at age six. Well, and the thing is, if you really feel like this is a risk for you, there's no reason you have to no. have your kid go right. to that Absolutely kindergarten not. class. You can give them a gap year <laughs> and right. have them start later, or e if right. they test out, they can go into first grade. There have been kids who have gone straight and, into and first it does, grade. And I and my have children who are, two of them have been on I, actually three out of my four children have had IEPs for different reasons. Two have been considered um, needing services. The other one was a speech delay that come to find out it was just he didn't want to talk. So um, what we did was we gave them that extra year for maturity wise because two of the four could have gone right into first grade. They passed the kindergarten test before they started kindergarten. And being academically ready and socially ready are two different things. Right, right. Exactly. So giving them the extra year to mature, all the academics were easy for them all the way through school. The academics was not the hard part. And then socially, they were a little bit more mature, so they just didn't get into as much trouble usually. They didn't have the emotional meltdowns that their peers did. And it's always nice to be the first one driving if your mother lets you drive. And it's, it's the first one working and holding a job in your class. That's not a bad thing, but it's, I have found that I think it's better to wait and put them into kindergarten at age six. What you do at home for that age five year, you take them grocery shopping with you. You have them start cooking with you. You have them start cleaning with you. They work in the garden with you. They do everything with you. They become your little shadow and your mini-me, and that alone is 
preschool, kindergarten. That's what they're going to learn. And that's not the only way kids learn either because my right. son listened to a lot of programs and he has a much stronger auditory um, ability than he does. And if he's right beside you, you learn, you know which way he learns. Right. Uh, and all my kids love to learn through songs as well. But Mnemonics. Yes. Really helps you remember things. Yes. But we also had the, the, the letters, the magnetic letters on the refrigerator. And then we have the leap pad and the, put it in and A says A, A says A. Uh, yeah, we look at that. <laughs> I don't know that. I have them. The, it's, they're still on my refrigerator, the, except upgraded to the three-letter one. Someday I'm going to have grandchildren, and I'm not getting rid of them. There is, of course, the, the option I would prefer the most, which is the full-time return to school, just because, as I've stated, my son requires a lot of engagement and a lot of redirection. Um, and with him being in high school now, um, I'm concerned about the loss of material if we stay in remote learning. So my preference would obviously be to return to school full time. I feel like that in-person engagement from the teacher is very critical to his development. Um, and I think it's also for kids who need that social interaction and sort of need help with those executive functioning, executive management skills, it's important. But here's the thing, return to school full time, when we say that, People have different ideas of what that looks like, too. You are correct. Yes, there was several arguments over whether or not kids should be required to wear masks. And there are a lot of differing opinions. But right. that personal interaction, particularly with my son, because he was so disconnected from peers, is really such a critical part for him Is right your now. son willing to wear a mask? Yes. Mine isn't. Right. So here's the thing. I bet there are teachers out there willing to go back and wear a mask, and some that are willing to go back without wearing a mask. I know some of them, well, there was one especially teacher the, in the elementary levels. There was one teacher at the meeting who actually said she got up and spoke, and I commend her because she said, I really would prefer to go back because I want that interaction with my students. Right. And, and I believe there are some people that just need that. As human beings, we're social. Why aren't we big enough to offer all of it? Why can't we have well, options for everyone? The Londoner, what Londoner is offering right now, what is proposed on the table and what they're voting on, is the full-time or remote for the elementary and middle and then hybrid, remote, or full-time for high school. So what's going to happen is the, the board is going to vote on this. So I think some of it's going to depend on what happens at the board. But if it were remote, I think knowing that there are options out there, or if it were full-time, is beneficial because it may not be the way some people want to go. Ultimately, they have to make the decision that's best for their child because this is really about right. what is best for them. And they family. may have three children, and what's best for a child one is not the same thing as Correct. for child Every three. Every kid is different. Right. And that's just, this is where parents hopefully have had more time to connect with their children and to see what works and what doesn't Some work for them. Some people did very well with remote learning because they weren't in that um, environment, and, and, yeah. and it's beneficial for them. And actually, VLAX may be an option for them going forward. That might be something that they could get, you know, an IV through and actually do great. It's just not for my kid. Um, as a as a child of an I, you know, parent with an IEP, and you also, we we fought for services, and we want those services for our kids. Um, as of right now, school districts do have an obligation to continue those services as written in the IEP. They don't have the ability to change it without permission or without calling a meeting, which we do know that some parents contacted us because they got WPNs, which changed Written the IEP prior notice, right. without the parents' permission, and that is not permissible. They do have to have a meeting, right. and it should not be based off, we're in remote learning now and we can't provide the services. It should be based off what I the child I have heard needs. rumors that Manchester will be contacting parents as well after the board vote because my IEP is written for full-time, in-person, no mask, no social distancing. Correct. And I spent hours, I, and my team, we didn't do a one-hour IEP meeting. It was a three-hour IEP meeting. And we worked really hard to make sure my son, part of his IEP requires being in a cafeteria with 200 people and his friends and learning to deal with the sensory issues Correct. required. Uh, it's that's very in his critical. IEP. I'm not willing to change that. Now, what do I do if they say remote only? My and that's, IP. That's where you have to make the choice, and oh, that's, that's where you have to try and. And figure you know what? So this is uh, that would be a topic for another hour or two, because I think there's going to be some lawsuits. 
Uh, well, I hope not. But the uh, I hope we can work it out. I, I'm, I'm po I feel that because we're offering three options that will... I think in London Dairy, maybe because you're a little bit smaller, a lot smaller than Manchester, you may have that chance. I don't think Manchester is going to work it out. We also have to remember, for parents with IEPs, the governor in his executive order did state that IEP teams had to meet within 30 days to reevaluate where the student was at and determine the proper and appropriate services. So if there was some type of loss, you can ask for compensatory services, number one. But number two, that should be addressed and adjusted so that the student has the best opportunity to learn because Unfortunately, about 20% of every class was sort of left behind and left floundering with the, the remote learning, but other kids did very well. So it would make sense that we would do what is best for each kid. Right. Um, evaluations are another issue with the IEPs. Um, evaluations are supposed to be conducted, however, they have to be done in person according to medical standards. Yes. They want to make sure that everything is copacetic and, and that um, it's being done correctly. Um, Fortunately, our district is saying that they will conduct in-person services for children with disabilities, but remote is not an option for evaluations. So if anybody contacts any parents and says, we are asking you to do a remote evaluation, that you cannot do. It is not going to be acceptable. It won't be an accurate right. evaluation. can't be. And kids who are tele-educating, attending school remotely, um, are, um, can come in for in-person services per the district special education director. So if they did require an evaluation, because obviously with the upcoming year, if we're going to be in remote learning for any period of it, and your kid is scheduled for an evaluation, that evaluation should still take place in person in the school. It's just that everyone else might not be in the school. The, the ed, um, education commissioner never shut that down. He always said that schools could have small in-person groups of the fewer than 10. I agree with you, but because the remote learning was supposed to be a short-term solution, they did sort of put them off. But at some point you have to say, we have to have these done because we, we have to know where the kids are. With, and it's not just kids who have IEPs currently. It's ones who have a su suspected disability who are not getting services because they haven't gone through the evaluation process. Right. That's, that's the scary part to be in. The other thing that has come up a couple of times with our group is that kids who are tele-educating or attending school remotely in college, and you may probably yep. heard of this, MCC. they're reporting that they're still being billed for campus fees even though they're not permitted to be on campus and are effectively banned from campus. So things like their health center fees, gym fees, and activity fees are still being charged. Um, some of the parents paid these fees and didn't realize they were getting paid for fees that their kids can't even use. And having that medical coverage is kind of a critical element when you're in school. So um, check the bills. Make sure that you're not being billed for this stuff if you can't use it because that's obviously not okay. Parents pay for their kids' college? Yeah. Some do, and some, some kids pay for it not themselves. Not Mother of the Year Award this year. <laughs> I think my kids pay their own way. One of the other issues that came up with the issue was but the issue of transportation to daycares. There's still no resolution on that. And it looks like the district simply isn't going to provide transportation to the aftercare programs except for the Moose Are Hill these school. remote aftercare programs? Uh, no, they're actually in-person schools. So they used to have a bus that transported from the and middle school and elementary schools directly to these daycare centers. And these daycare centers are operating in-person? Correct. But our schools Correct. are thinking about not? Right. Okay. Well, I mean, we don't know that yet. The okay. vote hasn't been taken, as you've said. Um, the parents are probably going to have to try and figure something out with the daycares. You and I both know there are places where bus drivers have been furloughed and that they might be willing or open to do a bus run for some of the kids to the daycare. Mm -hmm. But I always worry because kids in daycare, you don't want them hanging around. It's not great in terms of trying to figure out transportation. Right. Um, but there are, there are some options out there that I'm, I'm hoping they, they can get addressed. Um, the school also doesn't make any guarantee that in-person or hybrid will be available the whole school year, but parents are asked to commit to one model or another for every quarter. So if you start the year on remote... So London Dairy does quarters both in correct. elementary and high school? Yes. Manchester does trimesters for the elementary. Right. So we're different. Well, either we way, are. you'd have to commit to that, for okay. that full for, period for of time. For the marking, for that right. marking Just that so they can plan their resources properly, and right. that way they can well, adjust with every sense. marking quarter. And that does make sense, because you can't have people changing right. every other and, day. And you don't know whether your kids are going to have a good teacher or a bad teacher. 
um, well, hopefully they're all great teachers. Um, if the district goes full remote and the parents have to select some form of in-person learning, then they worry that they might have to redo all these options all over again. So there is also the risk that remote will become inevitable if there's an outbreak like some of the other According states. According to the NEA New Hampshire, that's what they're shooting for. The Teachers Union, New Hampshire Teachers Union, the NEA, and I believe the American Federation of Teachers, they don't want the teachers going back at all. Do you have a big NEA or AFT um, membership here in Melinda Dairy? Well, they have the union, yes. Oh, they do? Yeah. How many, because we've got about, only about two-thirds of our teachers in Manchester are part of the NEA. What about you? Do you have That I don't know. Uh, I'd find out, because they've been given their marching orders. Well, I'm hoping that there are other teachers, like the one who spoke at the meeting, who do want to return, because I do feel like that connection for some students. You know is what? All good teachers want to return in some way, shape, or form, whether it's with a mask or without a mask. I think all of our good teachers do want to return. I well, think, the other thing but is I, I don't want to start the year with full-time and then end up having to make a decision because they go, Remote. Welcome, really welcome to homeschooling. <laughs> It'll be the same the whole year long. You know I can't do that. <laughs> One of us is not coming out of that. <laughs> but, um, um, but some parents are not going to want to go through this process again, and they right. may want to just pick something that works for them for the whole year at this point in time. Right. Last time I did talk about COVID testing, COVID testing being available in town. Um, I also found out uh, convenient MD can do tests. The hospitals can do tests. The urgent site. Uh, care places can do tests and many of the providers who are local. Can okay, do so when you're talking COVID tests, you're talking tests to see if you have the virus now or are you talking antibody testing? So I'm talking about tests to see if you have the virus now. Okay. Now, if you suspect you have the virus, you can go in. Um, the state has indicated that most insurance providers are covering the test at no cost. However, if you don't have insurance, you can that go onto the New Hampshire Easy page and you can apply to get coverage for your test. So the testing. The, the money for the test should never be a barrier. Never be a barrier because there is an application on New Hampshire Easy to get coverage But if for you're that tested, test. your name is put into a state database, correct? That's true, yes. And they will do contact tracing to okay. inform other people if you've Not potentially been tested. Infected. And that is your right. Under mm -hmm. HIPAA, you have that right. Um, but there are some people who did ask, I was okay. sick back in February. I was sick back in March. Is oh. there any possibility that I have had COVID-19? Is there any way I can find out? Actually, you can find out, and that also is no test, but that's, no cost testing. Sorry, that's the no antibody cost test. test. It is the antibody test, but it will tell you if you've been infected. Now, is COVID running like other diseases, and it sh you have the antibodies for the rest of your life, or? You will you're have you're a nurse. You, you will me. have the antibodies for the rest of your life. This is the issue. When we get infected with something like a cold, we get antibodies to that and we get over that cold and you'll never get that strain of cold again. What happens is the cold virus mutates so rapidly that if you get exposed to another strain of the cold, you're going to get that strain of the cold, uh. which is why we typically get a cold a year or so. You know, I hate being sick, but Every year we seem to get an exposure to a strain that mm -hmm. we haven't encountered because it does rapidly mutate. Um, other things that we get, we get antibodies to it, which is why we get shots. If you get your measles shot, you've been exposed to it, you have antibodies, you don't get it if you get a second exposure, typically. If your shot wears out, this is why you have to go on your scheduled right. times, right. then you, you have a risk. But if you do get exposed to certain things like measles, rubella, and you are on that schedule with your shots, you don't get it again. And you never get sick with it to begin with. The vaccination is just a small exposure. Is the vaccination with live, vac with live is it alive or dead? Because I've heard there are, okay, I was in nursing school a really long time ago. So, but there are live vaccines and dead vaccines? Yes, so attenuated virus is dead vaccines. Okay. Most vaccines are dead. Okay. Some of them are live vaccines. What so would you, COVID be? If you get a flu when vaccine, flu vaccines like the nose, the one you got put up your nose, that's I live virus. It. Well, well, why would you do some that? Some people don't want to get shots. This is yeah, better for them. They, they're okay with why, it. Why would you get, so why would you want to expose yourself purposely? Um, it's a small amount. The risk is low. You do have to go home with a sheet to monitor your symptoms, but oh. that is true of any vaccination. Okay. When they give you the fact sheet, you really need to keep that and look for those things. Right. Fever, swelling, depending on what vaccination it is. Projectile vomiting in your child? Yeah. yeah. Any, mm -hmm. Anything that's 
unusual other than maybe being okay. sleepy or a little bit grumpy. If it's an extreme reaction, absolutely call the provider back. Now the COVID vaccine that they're talking about, this is not gonna be a thing anytime soon in my opinion, this is just my opinion, um, because it takes a while it takes a while first to develop the vaccine and they are in the stages of doing that right. but then they also have to do all sorts of testing and is it one of them like ready to go out to 30,000 people now if, if they roll it out to a lot of people there will be no long-term testing and they will have to make you aware of that and if okay. there is no long-term testing there are certain vaccines which had long-term effects which didn't become readily apparent until long-term testing now they might be minor side effects but it's better that you know what those side effects are going into it okay. than not knowing and being surprised. Um, they've been talking about creating a vaccination for HIV, and it's been decades since they've HIV. even talked about it, that's, I think. That's such an 80s thing. It, it is, but the, at the time, they were going to make a vaccine. 40 years ago. It was going to get rolled out, and, and it never came into fruition. There are right. other things. When I was a kid, everybody had chicken pox. Now there's a chicken pox vaccine. My, ne my kid has never had chicken R pox. My oldest did not have the chicken pox vaccine. It wasn't around. And yet the other three have had it. So yes, only one of them, only one of my four children. Right, but that's a change. I mean, they yeah. won't have that and they will potentially not have shingles when they're older. Mm -hmm. So, but the antibody testing for COVID is provided by Clear Choice MD. They are doing that testing at no cost. So if you were sick in February or March, you can go in, you can get that antibody testing done. Mm -hmm. um, and that way you'll know if you had that exposure and if, if it's something that's concerning you, then you'll know. And is, is that also being put into a database? Um, I don't know if the antibody testing is. I, I would imagine they would probably report it for contact tracing. I would think yes. Okay. Um, but the location is in Goffstown, New Hampshire at 558 Mass Road in Goffstown, New Hampshire. Again, that's at no charge. Okay. So if you have a concern that you may have had an exposure and you want to get the antibody testing, that is also available. All right, you covered your list. And they are doing studies on COVID right now, actively oh, right now, oh, sure. to try and determine how rapidly it's mutating. They don't have any definitive data in my opinion yet. I mean, they'll, they say there's this and there's that, but it seems to be changing and it seems to be, I, I think it will be a few years, honestly, before they have any solid um, You don't think it's going research. away? You think COVID is here to stay? Well, I mean, it, it's a- Have we ever had a disease that comes and then magically disappears? No. We've been able to get rid of some of them through so vaccination. Li life with COVID, get used to it, right? Well, I, I, I mean, the bubonic plague came back. I did not hear it was out s somewhere in Colorado right now. Th there has been some resurgences of it, and yeah. there's been resurgences of smallpox as well. But if so. we if we take our stats, we know a lot more about hygiene, washing so hands. So wash your hands. Wash your hands. That's the number one thing you can do is wash and your hands. And do you need to use antibacterial soap? Or uh, any old soap will do. You can actually, washing your hands with soap and water uh, is better than using hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer is grating to your hands and it will break apart the virus, but it is not effective as the singing happy birthday and washing your hands. Okay. Eat right. Yep, absolutely. Get your sleep. Yep, absolutely. Drink lots of water. Absolutely. Exercise and fresh air. And these are many things we do already. Exercise, fresh air, and absolutely. sunshine. Yep. Does the heat kill it? Do we know? We don't know. We don't have any definitive data that points that one way or another. So and I honestly have never heard of, of heat killing a virus. I mean, we're 98.6 degrees right, and it's right, alive right, in right, us. Right, so right, right. I, I've never heard of that, but it, it's possible. That some things have seasons, like flu has a season. Mm -hmm. So they're looking to see if this has some type of seasonal pattern. Um, but it may and it may not. They really don't know because they don't have a full year's data set yet. Okay. Well, we're fast approaching a year. That's true, and they should know. Quite, it seems to me that they do know a lot more every time they look at data, and uh, Abbott Labs actually developed a test. It's a 15-minute give-you-the-results blood test, um, probably preferable to the nasal swab, mm -hmm. but uh, the nasal swab is sort of uncomfortable. But um, not everywhere is offering that, so, you know, that is something. And the turnaround time is? 15 minutes on the Abbott test. <laughs> Where you, yeah, where do you get that one? But the other tests, it's what anywhere from two it's to seven days. It's probably in the. I would imagine it's probably in the hospitals because okay. they like quicker results. They want to know what they're dealing okay. with. But um, if not, if they're still doing the nasal swab tests, um, um, those results do take longer. That is the over. Seeing as how we are talking about education, how many deaths do we have in this state? Zero to nineteen. Zero. Thank you. 
and hopefully it will stay zero. We want it to stay zero. There is always an outlier, and every death is, um, is a tragedy to some family. That's true. However, people are going to die every single day. Well, we take a risk when we leave our homes because you, you could get hit by a bus. So, but, but nobody wants to have this happen to their... I actually pull the muscle getting out of bed one time. So, you know, getting out of your bed is a risk. <laughs> I went from my bed to the floor to the emergency room. But as always, if any parents have any questions and want to contact or want to talk to right. us about educational advice or options or anything, we are available. That's what moms do. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful day.